Glad everybody's relatively dry tonight. Yeah. You weren't made of sugar. So you dissolved on the way in. So that's good. So <clears throat> I just want to report the interruption from last week. Remember I got a phone call in the middle and I took it. It was very successful. He came out and did 12 stumps for $475. Well, I'm, we're, we're happy. We've already got the stumps kind of uh, spread out, and now this rain will just kind of take care of most of it. So, Well, th that's what I told, I told him yes, and Denise said, make sure that's, that's not per stump. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, fair enough. And he had a big machine. He, he was there three hours. And I had two that were three foot in diameter, a couple that were two foot. And then the rest of them were, were smaller, but they were all over the yard, so he, he traveled. So if you need a good grinder, I can turn you on to one. So that was, his name's Gordon. What was his last name? Gordon. <laughs> It's probably in my phone. If I'll, I'll text you his number if you're serious. Okay, okay. I'll email or text you his number tomorrow if I remember after I sleep. Okay. So we got the youth group leaving Sunday. Do you have big plans? At least half of them are gone, right? Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I took a group on mission trip one year, and we had some free time, and we decided to go to a movie, and Independence Day had just came out, and I mean, it had been out like two days, and I said, Let, let's go see that. Every one of them had already seen it. I had like 15 of them. I'm like, I, you've already seen it. So they went and saw something else, but when they discovered I was going by myself, they got worried, we, we, we'll see it again, you know. Not like, I live with five children, I'm going to be with you all week, I can do two hours <laughs> by myself. You just need that every once in a while, right? So they let me go to a movie by myself. But they were worried. They were good mother hens. Anything else we need to remember tonight? Clark, would you word our prayer here in just a second? So youth group, Janice's surgery next when uh, the 28th, so that's Tuesday, yeah. All right. I will mention, uh, I talked to the guy from Potter's House. He is not going to be here till Tuesday. So we can still bring paper goods through uh, Sunday. And uh, I'm going to meet him here on Tuesday morning and help him get loaded up. So we'll be through with that little project. All right, believe it or not, we made it to the place we call Second Kings. Now, it's really the same story, and I think probably because there was a limit to how big you wanted a scroll to be, right? <laughs> That's why there was, it's really better to think about it's king's first scroll, 
and Second Kings not a different story. It's just we're still going. So we're we're right in the middle of where we have been. But we get back to Elijah. Where has he been? So remember last uh, week we lost Ahab, and not only uh, is Ahab gone, but Israel, at least, is having more problems. Because look at 2 Kings 1, verse 1. After Ahab died, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now, I don't know how you're on your Israelite uh, geography, but the northern kingdom spanned both sides of the Jordan, and Moab was across the river from Judah, but up above was uh, part of North Israel. And during the time of David, they, they really kind of became a vassal state uh, to Israel. And so now with this turmoil, they've taken the opportunity uh, to rebel. And so Ahaziah, the new king, he's got problems on his hands. And then verse 2 it doesn't say why. Maybe he was clumsy or maybe he was pushed. I don't know. But he falls through the lattice work in the upper chamber and was injured. Now he wants to know whether he's going to get better. And so what do you do? You consult the Lord would be the right response from the king of Israel. But he doesn't. As you're reading there, he asked and sent messengers to Belzebub. Okay, now, if, if you listen closely, a lot of times, come in, a lot of times it talks about the Baals. So when we think about Baal, it, w it wasn't necessarily, and probably correctly, to think of them as one god. There were these gods all over the place. This one happened to be called Belzebub. What does that sound like? It sounds like Belzebub, and this, this is where that term later comes from. It's from this god who had his temple in Ekron. Ekron was in the western part uh, of Depending on the time and which map you look at, it, it, it was a Philistine city. Where, where have we heard Ekron before? There were a couple of ple uh, places. When uh, uh, David had his little uh, throwdown with Goliath, the Philistines in that defeat retreated to Ekron. So it was one of their five fortified cities. And um, we also hear about it when the Philistines capture the ark. You remember that? And they passed it around from Ashdod to uh, what was the other city it went to and then finally it ended up in Ekron. They all got, they, they all got tumors and sickness and rats and they didn't need it. And that Ekron was its last stop before it came back to Israel. So Ekron's been there for a while. Um, some of the maps showed it barely in actually Judah, but maybe on the line. But it's Philistine territory historically. And so this temple's been there for a long time. And Belzebub is actually... God of the flies. The whole idea is he's the God of plague and pestilence. And that's who Ahaziah wants to consult. Now, it's a little bit interesting because I would have expected him to send messengers the other direction. Back to where his mother came from. And the, the bell gods there, but for whatever reason, we're not told the explanation. He's like an Ekron. 
but the Lord's going to intercede. Verse 3, he sends Elijah, get up, go meet the messengers from the king of Samaria. Say this to them. You must think there's no God in Israel. That explains why you are on your way to seek the oracle of Baal Zabub, the god of Ekron. Therefore, this is what the Lord has said. You will not leave the bed you lie on, for you will certainly die. So in a sense, Elijah is making his medical diagnosis. You have a terminal uh, injury, and you're going to die. But what's also inherent in that, what's interesting that God is telling this North Israel king that he's going to die. What would you hope happened in that instance? If I was able to tell you tonight, you got 48 hours, what do you think you might do? You might get right with God. You might get ready. You might reflect on your choices and how you've lived, right? I think inherent in this, you're going to die, is not necessarily change and you won't. Maybe that's possible, but at least get your house in order, right? Be prepared uh, to meet the Lord. Elijah is so convincing. Think about this. If if the king tells you to go to Ekron, what are you going to do? And apparently they don't know, the messengers don't know who this is because we'll see here in a moment that they, they don't fully understand who they were talking to. But he was persuasive enough that they turned around. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what happens. Well, the, the, the king understands even before they speak, I think, look at verse 5. When the messengers returned to the king, he asked them, why have you returned? And in instance, wait a minute, why are you back so soon? You, it wasn't, you weren't gone long enough, right? You didn't have time to get to Akron and back, but you're back, and so what in the world's going on? So they tell him, a man came to meet us. He told us, go back to the king who sent you and tell him, This is what the Lord has said. You must think there's no God in Israel. That explains why, you know, same same story. Oh, yeah, and by the way, you're going to surely die. So at that moment, he's got a choice, right? Does he repent? How is he going to take this? The king asked them, verse 7, because he's suspecting already, right? Uh, tell me what he looked like. Describe his appearance. Well, they say he was a hairy man and had a leather belt. Okay, that probably meant something to them because I figure in that day and time, all men, you know, they typically grew a beard, would be hairy, and I'm going to guess most of them had a leather belt. But for whatever reason, this identified, because apparently... Elijah was known to be hairy, and that doesn't necessarily mean in the same way Esau. You know, we were told Esau was a hairy guy. It may just mean he wore uh, a lot of la- uh, animal skins, right? And I, I have to, at least for my picture, he's got wild, bushy hair, right? It just, it just fits the, what seems to be going on here. Maybe that's why guy like looks like that. We better listen to him. Maybe that was it. I don't know. And the king said, oh, yeah, it's Elijah. So knowing what you know, what does this make you think of? Who does this make you think of? So it's not accidental, I don't think, that you know, Elijah was going to call in the wilderness, and John the Baptist, looking like Elijah, I mean, I would think that's passed down in the stories. Maybe that was part of the attraction. People saying Elijah's back, right? He's hairy, and he's out in the wilderness. 
So apparently that's part of what's going on. But any rate, Ahaziah understands who it is. And so look what he does. The king sent a captain and his 50 soldiers to retrieve Elijah. Now they're just being nice, right? What what does retrieve mean? (laughs) Bring him by force, right? This is an arrest. Okay, it's Elijah. Why does he send 50 guys? Actually, 51 guys, right? Captain and his 50 men. The king realizes Elijah is formidable, right? 51 guys to get one guy. But that, to me, makes it even more puzzling. (laughs) And if he had that much respect for Elijah... Why isn't he listening to what he has to say? Why is he going to, in my mind, arrest him? So this guy shows up. And, and the real thing here is it's not disrespect for Elijah. In some ways, it's, it's disrespect to God that he's going to arrest his messenger So he had respect for the power, but maybe not for the position or the authority. Captain went down to him while he was sitting on the top of a hill. Did Elijah know what, was he just waiting? Did he have some pre-knowledge that these guys were coming? So the first guy shows up, prophet. The king says, come down. Who's in charge? Well, this guy's mine, the king. So again, this guy has respect for the position. He calls him prophet, but he's not seeing his authority or seeing God behind his authority. Or they might have approached this. And I think we're going to see this with the third group. Of course, uh, I like this in verse 10. Elijah's reply If I am indeed a prophet, he's not boasting, don't you know who I am? Uh, God's going to strike you dead because you insulted me. It's never centered, it doesn't seem to be on Elijah. But if I'm indeed a prophet, may fire come down from the sky and consume you and your 50 soldiers. Fire then came down from the sky and consumed him and his 50 soldiers. Just, that's what happened. Okay, again, Ahaziah is at a, at a point, a crisis point, right? At least a decision point. I thought I was going to arrest Elijah because I don't like him telling me I can't go to Ekron or whatever's going on. And instead of showing perhaps respect, approaching Elijah a different way, he sends another guy. 51 more guys go. And notice how this guy acts. Prophet, this is what the king says. That's in verse 11. Come down at once. That appears to me to be more forceful. He's not messing around. He's not like saying, "We're come on, let's go. We're taking you to the king. He's saying, you get down here and you get down now. I'm the army guy and I got 50 guys. What are you going to do? Surely it heard, right? <laughs> do you think he was better than the first? I, I don't know. This is confusing. Fire from heaven, gone. Fire from God came down from the sky, consumed him and his 50 soldiers. Verse 13, king sends third guy. I like this guy. Because, I mean, he works for the king of North Israel, but he's going to approach a lie. If the second guy hadn't heard, the third guy did hear 
what happened to the other two. And he approaches Elijah differently and in the same way, I think, is showing some respect for the Lord by approaching Elijah, his, his prophet, in this way. The third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. He begged for mercy. Prophet, please have respect for my life and for the lives of these 50, notice the phrase there, servants of yours. <laughs> we ain't working for the king. We're following and we're requesting you come with us but we're serving you. He says, Indeed, fire came down from the sky and consumed the two captains who came before me along with their men. So now please have respect for my life. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So he got up and went down with the king. I think we're going to see this over and over again. The king because he's king, thinks he has some special authority. He should be able to do what he wants to do, but that's not what the king is supposed to be doing. So what does it tell us about Ahaziah that he sent so many men? Stubborn, at least, right? He keeps thinking he can change the narrative, right, without the repentance, without the change on his on his behalf. I think so. I think you're right. What What kind of attitude do you have to have to willingly order people to go die to cover for you, right? That's pretty brutal, yeah. So Elijah goes with him. And, and, and you know, what is this all about even? Is this, is this payback? to Elijah for the things that happened with his dad? You know, what, what, what's going on? I think the better picture, what I take from this, is what does it say about humility? How would our country uh, be different if we dealt with each other in humility, not in my side, we're right about everything, and the other side is wrong about everything. There's no humility there. And certainly Ahaziah is having trouble with that. And it appears that it's God's intent all along to send Elijah to Ahaziah. But not until there was a different understanding, at least among the soldiers of Israel. So Elijah gets there, guess what? He asks the question, tells him what's going to happen. You will certainly die. And then we get to verse 17. And he did die, in keeping with the Lord's message that he had spoken through Elijah. And then one of the more unfortunate, just for keeping it straight in our minds, verses in the entire Bible. In the second year of the reign of King Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, over Judah, Ahaziah's brother Jehoram replaced him as king of Israel because he had no son. So I'm exaggerating a little bit. I... <laughs> You have Jehoram, king of Judah, and you have now Jehoram, king of North Israel. And to me, that's confusing because you can mix them up really easy. (laughs) 
I like that, yeah. He called his bluff, right? I, I like that, Clark, thanks. Yeah. How stubborn can I be? Well, he's used to them telling him what he wants to hear, right? And so we're done with kings for a moment, and we're going to um, deal with the changes between Elijah and Elisha here in chapter 2. And and for me, this is a great picture of, of, of what we're supposed to be doing. You know, we grew up in a culture where it's encouraged to make a name for yourself, right? Whether it's implicit or explicit sometimes, your whole purpose is to do something that you get recognized for, right? Even if it's a trophy for existing in soccer that we give kids sometimes, right? Maybe you've seen that little video. I got a trophy for existing in soccer. But we're driven by recognition. But I think this is going to be a different picture. And we're not really told how they know. But it appears that it's common knowledge that Elijah's leaving. And he's leaving in such an unusual way, I have a hard time thinking they fully understood what was about to happen, but maybe they did. Maybe I would have been the one confused if I was there and everybody else understood. But it says, just before the Lord took Elijah up into heaven in a windstorm, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. Elijah told Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Elisha's response, not leaving you. So is that because Elisha did understand what was going to happen? Well, let's look at the next verse. They went to Bethel. There were prophets there. In Bethel, they came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that today the Lord is going to take your master from you? He answered, Yes, I know. Be quiet. So the prophets in Bethel knew. Elisha said he knew. But yet he doesn't leave Elijah. So the answer is yes. Elisha did know. Same thing again this time. You know, these towns aren't that far apart, but they're walking, okay? So this doesn't just take 15 minutes to happen. They're going from Bethel to Jericho. Same things happen. They come out and say, did you know? And he says, yes, be quiet. Then verse 6, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. So Bethel. Jericho, now down to the Jordan River. And this is his reply again. As certainly as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they traveled on together. See, I want to know more. Was Elijah testing Elisha? Was Elijah trying to downplay that he's leaving today? You know, I, I, I've been faithful. I've done my work. I just want to quietly go. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to know if he's being private or if he's just trying not to be the focus. And what does that tell us about Elijah? The 50 members of the prophetic guild went and stood opposite them at a distance while Elijah and Elisha stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, folded it up, and hit the water with it. What does that sound like? Sounds like Moses done it, right? We've had some parting of the water. And you remember who was with Jesus at the transfiguration? 
Moses and Elijah. There, there, there's got to be some connection here. So they cross over in dry ground. And when they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, in my words, it's like, okay, you passed the test. You're, you're hanging in there. You're ready. What can I do for you before I'm taken away from you? Elisha's response, may receive a double portion of the prophetic spirit that energizes you. So what's interesting about this double portion? Who got the double portion? The firstborn. I hear Elisha asking is, I want to be your son in the faith. Your firstborn son. If you're concerned about what's going to happen after you're done, it's me. That's what I want. That's why I'm here. That's why I've stuck with you. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a fiery chariot pulled by fiery horses appeared. They went between Elijah and Elisha. How did Elisha go to heaven? Most times we think he goes, you'll hear people say he went in a fiery chariot, but he did not. It says right here, he went up to heaven in a windstorm. Not in a chariot. I think I always thought he went in the chariot because that's how I would have gone, right? If there's a fiery chariot, sure, I'm jumping in and going. Notice verse 12, Elisha's response. My father, my father, the chariot and horsemen of Israel. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly what that means because I'm not sure, but I think it's significant. If I'm fighting a battle, what do I want? Normally we'd want the 51 men. I think that's a good way to say it. We want an army. We want our tanks. We want our, our bombers. Because that's how you win wars, right? But Elijah, I think part of the message here is Elijah is more important than the horsemen and chariots of Israel. He is like the horsemen and chariots of Israel because of his connection with the Lord. The presence of spiritual leadership is more important than chariots and horsemen. I think that's the bottom line here. And here's what's fascinating. You, you don't have to turn here because you just heard it. But in 2 Kings 13, 14, there is this phrase, my father, my father, the chariot and horsemen of Israel. Same phrase. But this time, it is King Jehoash saying it to Elijah as he is dying with a terminal illness. So what is that? It's a little glimpse. We're not there yet, but it's a little glimpse forward, a little foreshadowing. Does Elisha receive this double portion of God's spirit? I, I think so, because here is the king of Israel saying the same thing about Elisha here in about uh, 12 more chapters. I found this as I was preparing a comparison of Moses and Elijah. So uh, I didn't write this, so if you want to argue with parts of it, I don't care, it's, it's not mine, but I thought it was a good uh, comparison. Moses and Elijah, they both stood alone for righteousness. They were associated with fire upon mountains. 
They were associated with the desert. They met God on Sinai. They were chased out of their countries by pagan rulers. They knew God's miraculous provision for food and water. They wandered in the desert for a period measured by 40. Moses for 40 years, Elijah for 40 days. They both fasted for 40 days. They were both examples of praying men. They both parted waters. They both had close associates who succeeded them. Elisha with Elijah. Joshua for Moses. And this one was my favorite. And both of these successors also parted waters. And they both had mysterious or strange ends. Here you have Elisha going up in a whirlwind. Remember Moses just kind of went up on the mountain and we didn't hear about him anymore. No great details about what happened. So now let's pick up at the end of verse 12. Then it says, Elisha could no longer see him. He grabbed his clothes and tore them in two. But now here's the moment of decision. Yes, he's upset he wasn't ready for Elijah to go. Are we ever, particularly people that nurture us and lead us and are mentors to us? But there's verse 13. Because this is the decision moment. He picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen off him. And and that was the badge of, of prophet. And went back and stood on the shore of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen off Elijah, hit the water with it, and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Now, I don't think that was said in doubting, but as in his first act of claiming that mantle, of taking the baton, of deciding, yes, I have to say yes at the moment to carry what Elijah's been doing. When he hit the water, it divided and Elisha crossed over. So this starts... Elisha's leg of the race, right? It's not about individual accomplishment as much as I think we look at what are we passing on, what position are we putting the next person behind us to be able to run. It's a relay. It's not an individual race for glory, and I think Elijah and Elisha show us that. We have our own leg of the race to run. And somebody's passed the baton to us, and our job is to pass it on. That's one thing I appreciate at this church is we care for our kids, and and we want to be active in passing that baton on, that they will carry after we're long gone. We don't have a 70-year plan We have a 700-year plan, right? Because it's us and then them and then the ones after them and the ones after them. Verse 15. When the members of the prophetic guild in Jericho were standing at a distance, saw him do this, they said, the spirit that energized Elijah rest upon Elisha. So they were instant witnesses to what God was doing now through Elisha. They met him, bowed down to him on the ground before him. They said to him, look, there are 50 capable men with your servants. Let's go and look for your master for the wind sent him from the Lord may have carried him away dropped him on one of the hills or in one of the valleys. 
So they're still not fully comprehending that Elisha's, Elijah is gone. And so Elisha keeps saying, no, 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 no. Okay, if you got, just go. Just, I, you don't ever do this, right? I, 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 I would never do this with grandkids. Just go do it. Just, just quit talking about it. <laughs> so they went, and they, they came back, and Elisha's like, I, I told you. It, it wasn't necessary, it wasn't helpful. So the prophets understand Elisha's authority, and we're going to have two quick stories here to end out chapter 2. Can you believe we did two chapters in one night? This is amazing. The men of the city said to Elisha, Look, the city has a good location, as our master can see, but what's the problem? Bad water. And if it's summertime, bad water is doubly bad, right? I've told you about the the summer camp we went to had sulfur water. It was it was dangerous because we needed to drink and you couldn't drink. I get it. I'm with these guys. Place looks great. What does Elisha do? He says, "I can, I can, I can help with that." This. But, but look how he approaches it, verse 21. He went out to the spring, threw salt in it, then said, this is what the Lord has said. Again, Elisha is following in Elijah's footsteps. He's not saying, hey, yeah, I'm the guy. Look at me. What does he say? God took care of this. Let's understand what's going on here. So do you think um, that helped Elisha's authority? Absolutely. Elisha continues speaking as directed by the Lord, just as Elijah has done. Now you probably know this next story. Sometimes we just lift it out and tell it. Uh, or we tell it to say don't. You know, I've had bald friends who say, you know, don't make fun of my bald head uh, with this story. But I, I think there's a lot more going on here. Elisha went up to Bethel. You remember what Bethel means? House of God. It's where Jacob wrestled, right? Or is that the stairway? I always flop them. It's the stairway. It's where... Jacob sees the stairway to heaven. What else more recently has happened at Bethel? One in the north, in the south, Bethel, sets Jeroboam, so they wouldn't have to go back to Jerusalem, sets up a golden calf. So do you think it's accidental that Elisha's heading to Bethel? Let's, let's take back the house of God for God. I don't think it's accident. So he's going up and some young boys come out. Now if you're reading the King James, what does it say? The, the, the old King James actually says little children which makes this story a lot more horrific if it is, you know, if it's five-year-olds that he curses, that's different than a bunch of punk teenage boys, youths that are coming after him, right? Uh, so most of your newer translations are going to say youths or young boys. They make fun of him. Go on up, you old baldy, which is the idea he's going to, if you're, if you're so great, why aren't you following Elisha? Now, I always thought it meant he was bald, but if you think about it, Elisha's pretty young. He serves for 50 more years. 
So it's very likely that he wasn't bald as we think about it. It may have been he was just less hairy than Elijah. Because you remember what was Elijah known for? You know teenagers, they don't need much of a hole to turn it into an insult. So maybe that's what's going on. Somebody else suggested they see him as an outcast and lepers shave their head. And, and so maybe they're just saying, you're an outcast. You're a, you're a baldy. You're like a, you're like a leper. Clark? Yes. I think it's mm-hmm. I think it's sarcastic. I think it's we don't believe your story about how Elijah went out. Think about the implications of that for the point. That if you kill Elijah or you die in his body or in other words, it's doubting that Elisha was a prophet. You're a liar. And my question would because we don't know the age here, my question is where have they been hearing this? Yeah, and perhaps I'm thinking they heard it at home or they heard it from the elders of the city. They're just repeating what they heard, right? Somebody said it and they just they repeat it. So you know what happens. He calls out two uh, female bears. They come out and they rip 42 boys to pieces. Now, that's even probably more graphic. Some of your versions will say maul, 49, uh, 42 boys the literal means cut cut them up and so what is the assumption here when you hear cut to pieces well that they're killed but it doesn't say that now they may have been I'm not saying that's out of the realm of possibility but I don't know that this was the purpose here if we go back to Clark's point that they're making fun of him because he's not living up to Elijah or that somehow he's, he's not the same or he's lying about it. It's a mocking. Hunter. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and they very may well have been. uh, Well, the the other part of this, and and so we're not going to know how it happened, but it says 42 of them were, were mauled. There could have been a hundred of them, right? It doesn't say every boy that was there was mauled. And, I, and you will notice it does say young men. There were no young ladies there. Thank you. But it's no doubt that they were mocking Elisha, but in truth, who were they mocking? God. And the sins of the fathers are being pushed on to the children And perhaps, if they didn't die, this might be an act of mercy to wake this town up. So you think you can mock God? You might want to make a different choice. How many of us had formative experiences when we're young that changed our path? Could it have been? And I don't know. I'm not going to be able to prove this. I'm just asking the question. Could it have been an act of mercy? All right, we'll stop there. Glad you're here tonight. Be safe going home.